choose not to live in a world of filters. Realize your mistakes, set the foundation for your success, get some wins. Knucklehead Podcast. Well, we, uh, we just went to the recording. So, hey, listen, everybody, welcome to another edition of Knucklehead Podcast. Uh, I've got with me today, uh, this is the Knucklehead Stephen, by the way. I am absolutely excited to have, um, well, I, here, here's the thing. When I have people that I know well on, the, on this podcast, I get excited. One, because you, the audience, gets a chance to get a small glimpse into some of the conversations that, uh, that me and this individual had years ago, and, and you get to actually experience the benefit of their growth over the last few years or however long they've been around. Uh, you get a peek into that. And so I'm excited for you. I'm excited for the listener to be able to listen to this. Uh, I've got with me a buddy of mine. Uh, he's an entrepreneur. Um, he is, uh, he's a stand-up comedian. I don't even, are you still doing stand-up comedian? I mean, comedy, you're, you're, you're kind of like a jack of all trades. He's like a smorgasbord. He is literally like the, the Swiss army knife of all entrepreneurs here in Austin. Scotty Gasso, what's up, buddy? Hey, what's up, man? Uh, my wife told me that, um, until I start getting paid, I'm not allowed to do any more off color or like, I'm not allowed to do more jokes until I, I start getting paid. So, okay. All right. So well, that's, I think that's so, a fair metric to be held accountable to, isn't it? Yeah. But I was like, well, how am I supposed to get paid if I'm not like doing jokes? You know what Seriously. I mean? And so, and yeah, you, no. did, you well, didn't you classify know. the amount of pay. I mean, typically if you go out there and you get, you know, if you get paid like a beer, you know, or, or a drink or, Hey, listen, let me, let me get you a uh, let me get you a diet coke. That's that constitutes some type of of payment for your for your services. Absolutely, man. Like uh, you know, the way that all started was like I want when I was a kid, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. Like if you would have asked like what do you want to do when you grow up? And like, yeah. you know, people want to be doctors, lawyers, blah, blah blah, whatever. All I wanted to do was be a stand-up comedian and I made it like a new year's resolution. I was like I'm going to actually like follow through and do this and I mean it was the most challenging nerve-wracking like just hardest thing I've ever probably done in my entire life okay so there has to be a story do you, do, I mean when you did you bomb at any one point in time where you just were like all right I know I've wanted to do this my entire life but good lord that was painful uh, that was that was just that was str struggle through that one well, you know, I'll tell you this, like Austin is a good place to do comedy just because the people are kind of so receptive and things like that. So um, I don't think my sets were necessarily like great, but um, I didn't get booed off stage or I didn't like, you know, people didn't like throw tomatoes at me or anything like that. You know, it was just uh, uh, more of like just a, a really good learning experience. Like, you know, getting a, getting a laugh was just like, I mean, it was so rewarding. I mean, you know, I had a comedy coach and we worked on jokes and like wrote material and like the whole thing. And so the experience was just like super cool. You know what I mean? But like, like yeah, I mean, awesome. to get up on stage, the lights on you and everybody is expecting you to make them laugh is like unreal pressure. But I don't, it's, it's a, it's a bit like dancing on stage in front of everybody else. And it's interesting because you're the phenomenal dancer too. You, your, your story on how you proposed to your wife, there, that's a completely different topic. I know that's getting into personal stuff, but my <laughs> goodness gracious, man, that's a, uh, you had, you had me at hello during that process. No homo. I'll, I'll put it to you that way. So it was, well, you it know, was awesome. I got lucky. Um, you know, her mom told her, you know, like, Hey, when, you know, when you find a guy, find a guy that can dance, like always marry a man that can dance. And so I got really lucky that I knew how to dance, I guess. <laughs> she had, she had good conditioning from the get go. She was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have a one up, sir. Well, uh, listen, so what, we, uh, what we're going to get into today for everybody who's listening, if you're first time listeners, listen, you can always check out Knucklehead Podcast. We've got a boatload of episodes for you to uh, sift through. At the end of this episode, you'll be able to hear how to go access more material about Scotty, how to get in touch with him, how to support him and his business, how to be a part of uh, you know, some of the things that, uh, that he has um, you know, going on in his life at this point. And, uh, and the whole point of Knucklehead Podcast is to simply this. I mean, we don't have to participate all the time in a world of filters. Scotty and I were just talking about this prior to recording. And, and, and too often, people share their highlight reels or they'll share this, this kind of isolated. Um, it, there's a distance that creates more isolation. And you don't have to, you don't have to just, uh, you don't have to participate in that and further substantiate the need for, for help. You don't have to... Uh, 
what I equate to just standing in the driveway and shouting at the top of your lungs, hoping that somebody would listen, which is the equivalent of like a Facebook post in some cases, you can literally go out there and connect with folks and talk with people and you don't have to be beta about the process. And there's not one person who has all the answers, but there's a boatload of people who are out there and tell you that they have all the answers. Um, we're just here to share a few things, uh, go out and get some wins, go out and iteratively take some steps to overcome some of the obstacles uh, you don't hear that a lot when people are just sharing their successes all the time. There's failures that myself, uh, that I go through every single day. Um, I fail all the time. I fail multiple times a day. I'm in sales. I'm an entrepreneur. I screw up. I screwed up earlier today. I got upset with my kids. Uh, you know, so I fail constantly, but at the same time, I'm willing to share that with folks to let them know that we've got goals to hit. And so therefore you, you can't cry over spilled milk in order to, in order to make some, you know, scrambled eggs, you got to break, you got to break some eggs. I forgot what the saying is. I'm sure it's not that, but anyway, so Scotty, you got to break some eggs to make an omelet. Thank you. See, you know, yeah. you got it. You got it. That's why you have way smarter folks on your podcast than you. <laughs> so that's why we call ourselves knuckleheads. So anyway, um, I love what Scotty has done. I've been friends of his, a uh, friend of his, I've known him through, you know, some casual acquaintances uh, for the, for the last few years and really seeing him and what he's done. Um, Scotty, I'm interested in what is it that you do, how you got started working with folks in the body? What have you seen in terms of, uh, of failure, what failure has done, what's failure done for you? And I'm, I'm just, I'm interested in how you got started helping folks the way that you, they help, help people. Man, you know, we were kind of talking about this a little bit before, you know, like, uh, we started recording, but like, uh, you, you kind of mentioned you're like, man, you're just like, you know, like you're kind of this jack of all trades and you, you kind of do this for your clients and stuff like that. But it really kind of all like started with me. Like I, I, when I started training, you know, I initially got into training because like I just kind of, I needed a job. Right? right. And then, you know, I'd waited tables for a really long time. So like I'd already kind of knew how to work in the, you know, with the public and, and work with people on a really small level. Um, but like, what what really flipped my training um into being something that i think is special for my clients was you know like i had kind of started doing uh like counseling and therapy when i was in college and somewhere um probably about like the third or fourth year of me training um just had a really hard relationship i had a had a breakup um just the world felt like it was kind of like my little world was like you know coming down and so um, I really dove in to like, I really wanted to like fix myself. And I found that the more I worked on myself, the, the, the more capable I was of being a better listener and helping my clients and, and guiding them. And, and so it really started with me, like, you know, um, like just like fixing the things about myself that I didn't like, and then being able to say like, Hey, I've been there. Like I've done this. Yeah. Like, you know, you can do this too. Like, it, you know, it's not, you know, there's such a big stigma on like getting help for as far as like mental, mental health, right? That's, ex that's exactly what I, I, I almost wanted to, to jump in a second ago, but you, you literally walked right into that. Yeah. What stigmas and what preconceived notions did you have uh, that you, you almost had to go through this kind of traumatic experience in order to humble yourself to go get that help? But what, what specifically did you have to overcome or what specific preconceived notions did you have before you decided to, to engage in some therapy? Well, dude, I think, I mean, I think I was like everybody, right. I was like, you know, like therapy's not for me. Like that's, that's, that's not for me. Right. That's, that's, that's that guy. That's got that guy over there that has all the problems and stuff like that. Like, I don't need to talk to anybody. I can solve all those problems myself. Like, or the, you know, even the aspect of like uh, being very macho about it. Like, you know, like I'm a man, I don't need, I don't need help. I can, I can do everything. Right. And you just realize that like, like life, like life is constantly loading you up with things. Right. And there has to be an outlet out of you in some form of fashion, whether it be through like meditation or talking to someone or a close friend you confide in, you have to be able to let that out otherwise it just kind of builds up and sits you know what i mean and so you know for me like it was like in the beginning i didn't tell anybody i went nobody knew i went to therapy right and now i tell everybody now it's like you know it's probably one of my biggest passions is like like uh like mental health and and people taking care of themselves like via their mind because you know 
like it's it's such a, a such an ignored subject in our society and in and, and, and a broader standpoint it's like you know we don't do anything about it as a society either you know what i mean and it's still a giant stigma well i think you you touched on some some very glaring issues that um i mean i, I don't we don't need to go and start diagnosing the country as a whole i i think that we're all just a group of, of individuals who are surrounded by people who we at least want to let in and we're not taught to, to be vulnerable and when you're and when you are vulnerable that's literally the only time where you've decided that whatever control you have you've you've let go and um and because <laughs> because you don't you don't really have any control anymore of of uh, the outcome, uh, you're susceptible to uh, either outside forces or or what other folks can do, and and then so in a way you almost feel like you've got to shrink in, and you you don't want to be judged. You, you've got this judgmental nature of yourself. Human nature is we want to we want to shrink back. We we have to kind of fight against it if we actually would like to grow. We have to go against natural tendencies, and it's just it's so bizarre um, that there wouldn't be it wouldn't be at least more encouraged. I think that. You know, I think that I don't know what your experience is, but communicating with other folks that have either had a similar experience or they're at that point where they're about ready to go get some help, they're more receptive to it. You you typically run into issues with folks that haven't realized they had an issue, or they've let those preconceived notions dictate their behavior or acceptance going forward. Now, is that just me, or or do you feel like that's part of your experience too? I you know I I. I feel like there's, I feel like there's a lot of people that it's like, uh, it's like, it's, it's like, it's like exercise, right? In the sense of like, people know they should exercise and they know exercise is good for them, but it becomes something that like, well, like I'll do it tomorrow or it's something you put off or it's something like, ah, I'll go and I'll walk on the treadmill, but I'm not going to do other things. And like, you know, I think everybody, it's hard. You'd be hard pressed to find a person that goes like, um, "Yeah, like I'm totally fine. Like I don't need to talk to anything, anybody about anything." But there's the spectrum is so broad from that small group to the opposite end of people that like you know have a therapist they see all the time and stuff like that. And everybody in between is like somewhere along the path. You know, it's just like it's kind of giving them that little extra push, like over the edge. Uh, you said something like, "I'm gonna give you kind of an analogy, right?" So are you a baseball fan? Oh, yeah. I love the Houston okay. Astros. Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. So we all, we, if we're baseball fans, we kind of all know Barry Bonds, right? And we know Barry Bonds, like, took steroids and all that kind of stuff. I find it very interesting that all the guys that came out and admitted they took steroids and apologized, as a whole, as America, in loving baseball, we all forgave them, Right. But the guys that deny it and do, will not tell you that they've done it, we still hold this negative st stigma. And all we want you to do is just like say, "Hey, I'm sorry," and apologize or admit to a mistake. And we'll go like, we'll we'll bring you in with open arms and go, "Man, it's okay, it's fine. We all make mistakes." But like, yep. it's it's weird how that works. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It it completely it almost changes the uh, it almost changes the whole dynamic of the conversation. Like um, people's opinions of of um andy pettit uh for it's just a you know as by example he he came right out and admitted yeah I, I had some issues but i you know my elbow probably shouldn't have done it i apologize yeah he but played, I, he, he actually played baseball again yeah it's it's and and you you like you, you compare that to um you know people who are probably still under some type of congressional subpoena with rafael palmero and you know roger clemens and those guys they're i mean without question Yes, the entire Major League Baseball was doing this. Most people have come out and admitted it. Like, you're literally, we, it's almost like we have everything but the pictures of you doing it. And there's probably those that exist. Come on now. Um, right, right, right. But to your point, it, it, very, it very much is like um, um, people who say, that, hey, I have a doctor's appointment. And they're, you know, they're up at work. And they literally could just, they could be going to get a therapy session as opposed to, you know, uh, I sprained my ankle playing basketball. And which one has a more long-term effect on their, uh, not necessarily their success metric, but their long-term ability to actually enjoy the fruit of what it is that they're doing. It's, it's that, it's that therapy session. And it's kind of a, a weird analogy, but I, I wanted to bring that up because I want to know what's changed about your life since you decided to start doing that. So like, 
when I like, you know, look, my 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 childhood was in, in my eyes was great, man. I had my parents are married, right? They're not divorced, right? Um, they gave me everything that I wanted. They took care of me. I, you know, I got cool shoes every school year. My dad was a farmer. My mom was a teacher. We live in a small town. Like everything should be. I should have like no issues, right? But um, you know. I suffer from uh, a lot of anxiety. Um, I have a lot of stuff that like, uh, I'm a people pleaser, right? And so like, I just want everybody to be happy around me and I want to take care of all my friends and stuff like that. Um, and that drives um, uh, some negative behaviors, right? And those manifested into me having a really bad temper um, when I was in like high school and college. Like I'm very uh, verbally abusive, violent temper. And like I, when I first started therapy, I thought I was going for my temper. What I was really going for was my anxiety and like, you know, the the stresses that having uh, like friends that I care about, like you know, have some things happen to them and taking on their emotions and stuff like that. And so, you know, the big change for me, like in going to therapy, was I learned how to manage my own stressors, my own anxiety, my own things. I learned that like, like, like no one's going to do this for me. Like, you know what I mean? And, it, and it's great to be angry at people and blame everybody else. But like, really, it all comes back down. I mean, you're the, you're the common denominator in every interaction you have. You are. So if you don't change you, if you don't do something about you, the interactions stay exactly the same. They don't change because they're the, the interactions that you have out with the people around you. You know what I mean? So like it, it was just a matter of learning how to like manage like all this stuff that was built up inside of me. You know what I mean? Well, life happens to everybody, right? I mean, you you touched on it. Common denominator, or common denominator, and everybody's experiences themselves. Life happens to everybody. You know, you could you could literally line two people up, and exactly what's uh, uh, exactly what's going on with those folks is is. Um, you could literally over, overload both people side by side and have a completely different result based off of the, the training that those folks have decided to engage in or the help that they, uh, they go and elicit from other folks. And those people who are ill-equipped have a smaller context to pull from. And those, and those folks who have decided to either go get some help or uh, have had training in the past uh, they're able to largely handle those circumstances substantially differently. So therefore the outcome is going to be different. And I can tell you right now, from an immaturity standpoint, I always felt like I had to have answers uh, when I did it. Uh, so it sounded as if I, you know, I could, I could uh, communicate a message when in fact I, what I was doing was just shooting from the hip and seeing what sounded good. And it just, it was, it was a, it was a debilitating feeling when somebody who's been there, done that calls you out on it. And, you know, it's, it's a really helpless feeling now when like whenever you're, you're held accountable because you have a family, you know, children to be responsible for. And like you said, nobody else is going to do this for you. Welcome to, right. it's like, welcome to the real world. You know what I mean? Well, you know, and, and in using like the, like the baseball analogy again, you know what I mean? Like I found that people, people are so much more receptive to me saying like, Hey, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll find it for you or like, I'll get the answer for that, or I know someone that does, right? And it's this, it's this softening, this human um, aspect about people that they embrace, just like the baseball player that admits he took steroids. Like they, they, you know, like, you know, it's really easy to be cynical about people in this like day and age, but like a lot of people, like they just want, they just want like some interaction, right? So like, as an example, um, Every time I go into a gas station, right, I always ask the gas attendant, like behind, if I'm buying something, whatever, I go, how's your day? How are you doing today? Like, how's your day going? You know how many people don't ask the gas attendant, like, how's his day going? And you would be mind blown, like, the, like just like the, the overload of information they throw out on me because no one has asked them how they're doing today, right? And so, like, I try to, like, kind of interact with people as much as I can because, I mean, like, like we're losing so much of that and it's so much of like what we need. Like, um, I do a lot of studying on like, um, on aging. Right. 
And one of the things that they say uh, aids the longevity of life is your interaction with other human beings. And like, as you get older, it becomes more important to have interactions with other people because it's what kind of, it's, it's what keeps you mentally young and energized and feel good and, and people give off love and hugs and all the things that we kind of talked about before. Oh, you know, sure. like, I mean, you, you, you need that stuff. You know absolutely. I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Without question, without question. And, and we could just use anecdotal evidence to, to support that argument. But really, quite frankly, if you look at, um, uh, at couples, anybody, anybody who's, who's heard the story of somebody who's passed away, and several months later, I mean, they're at, out of almost heartbreak. Their their significant other passes away right after them. It's just because it it um, there's so many stories of that just holding up to be to be absolutely true. It's sad. It's sad to see. Um, I, I I we could talk for hours. You and I could sit here and just and go back and yeah. forth. And what I'm interested in um, is you you do training, right? You do uh, you're you're going to become a, a coach here relatively soon if you're not doing that already. I'm curious, mm -hmm. how can people find you? How do people, I mean, we've got literally just a few minutes here to wrap up, but what is it, what, how can people find you? Where, where can people get in touch with you? And then maybe one last parting thought after you do that. What, what is it that you felt like has been the most helpful outside of therapy? Is it a book? Is it a conversation? Is it a mentor? What, what is it that's helped you the most after people can hear how to find you or get in touch with you? Um, so um, it, to get in touch with me, uh, probably the easiest way is just like just to email me. Okay. And it's, it's, it's simply my name. It's Scotty I E. So it's S C O T T I E uh, period Gassner G A S S N E R um, at gmail.com. Uh, and then that, you know, an e a simple email um, has all my website information when I email you back, stuff like that. And so that's usually like the easiest way um, to like get a hold of me. And like, you know, I, this is going to sound crazy, but when I, when I was a kid, um, I, I was kind of a, I was kind of a wussy. I was kind of a mama's boy, you know what I mean? And like, um, my dad was a farmer. He's a very tough guy. Very, um, he only spoke when he needed to, um, had a really dry sense of humor. Um, but the one thing I really loved about my dad was, um, he did the right thing always, no matter if it put him in a bad spot or maybe put him in a bad light. If it was the right thing to do, he always did it, Right. And it's, it's weird, like, as my life has kind of progressed, like, I kind of transitioned away from my mom and, like, closer to my dad, which was, like, my total goal. I mean, he was, like, my idol, like, growing up. I wanted to be this, this great, like, almost Boy Scout type guy. And, like, and so he really, in doing nothing, he did everything to shape kind of, like, who I am as an adult. Those are the, those are the stories that quite frankly, I love to hear because you don't see, you don't hear a whole lot of stories about, well, when you do hear a story about a, uh, a boy growing up, a lot of times it has to do with either a dad or a father figure that helped mature them or helped assist in their maturity. Uh, right. It's not a knock at all on single mothers. It's not a knock at all on a, on somebody who's trying to make ends meet because somebody has decided to run away. Somebody being a male has decided to go run away and not be a father. Um, but you hear it more often than not when somebody has, has accepted ownership for the maturity in their life, either it was a father or a father figure that helped that particular boy grow up. And, uh, and that's, that's awesome. So that you, well, it's, it's inspiring to hear that you decided to come full circle and, uh, and kind of be more attracted to the old, uh, the old man and uh, and the old farmer, the old farmer work ethic, if you know what I'm saying. Well, you, you know, what's crazy about it is, is like, it was always my plan, but like, I didn't know how I was going to get there. And then just almost like, it felt like almost like by osmosis, by just like watching him and doing and listening and learning. Like I started to evolve into this person. And my dad is a very like calm, patient guy. And I had to learn that by like going to therapy. Like I, I wasn't that person. And I had to learn that like, I mean, he kind of was already like that. And I had to like learn that. And then I, I noticed how much like him I became just by like changing those, those negative patterns in my life, you know? Well, you heard it here. There's a, it's a testimony right there to somebody who's been able to, 
uh, to change their life when talking with somebody. So, Scotty, I appreciate you taking some time. Uh, we're going to yeah, call that yes, a wrap. Any, any parting thoughts, any last words uh, for the folks as we sign off here? I, you know, I just, just one real quick thing. You know, you were talking about, like, uh, you know, that you fail constantly and you're just looking for wins. Well, you know, in the yin and yang, you know, you have to fail in order to have a win. And, like, I, I, it's weird. I feel like my life has been this accumulation of failures, right? But where I needed to win, those failures built that position. So like, whether it was like meeting my wife and like getting married or like the job that I have or whatever, all the failures that I have built up into this giant win, right? Because you learn all these small things along the way. So, you know, you're talking about like get some wins, man. Like the, the wins you get are built off of all your failures. You know what I mean? And so like, you know, you fail a lot to get these big wins or, you know, I mean, and it just, it, it's so much more rewarding because you were, it was work and you paid for it. Like, you know, you learned, I mean, you know, and if everything was easy, everybody would do it. You know, that's the truth. That's the truth. Yeah. That's why most people don't. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate you. I appreciate you. You heard it here. Scotty dot Gasner at gmail.com. Listen, folks, don't be bait about the process. Go out and get you some wins and make today be the day that you start to take ownership, uh, responsibility for your life. And go out there and make it happen so appreciate you scotty thank you very much everybody yes, thank you we'll see you next week take care guys